Good, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for logging in today. Um, I'm going to provide a brief overview of emerging infectious diseases. This is a broad topic, and um, you know it's difficult to cover everything, so I wanted to give a quick snapshot to help those of you um, primarily in the clinical setting. Sorry, it doesn't want to advance. So today we're going to just go a brief um, overview over the biology of various pathogens that cause emerging diseases, and we're going to talk about the public health importance of these organisms and viruses. Um, also, after today, you'll be able to demonstrate a basic understanding of transmission and exposure risk, and then we'll talk um, a little bit about best practice concerning exposure prevention to employees, since these are all um, different diseases you may encounter during your day-to-day -day work and know how to best protect yourself. So today, the way I've um, designed the webinar is to briefly talk about emerging diseases and provide a brief introduction, and then to go a little bit more specific into vector-borne zoonotic diseases, hemorrhagic fever viruses, and drug-resistant microorganisms, all of which have become pretty prevalent in the day-to-day -day conversation in infectious disease. So first, um, we need to define what is an emerging infectious disease. So this, okay. um, basically, an emerging infectious disease is one that um, has recently appeared within a population or um, is a disease that is now in a new location, new ge geographical range, um, and also one whose incident is increasing where maybe we didn't see it increasing before. Sometimes we see new agents, so we're going to talk a little about Zika. Uh, Zika is uh, newer, but it was um, previously found in the 50s. Um, also, agents that have spread to new geographical locations. So again, Zika is a good example of that, going from Africa to South America. Um, known agents whose role in diseases was not really known and was previously unrecognized, but now we're seeing new developments. And also reemergence of agents. So that's when we talk about the drug-resistant microorganisms and how previously we were able to treat and cure those infections, but now we're seeing new reemerging issues. So this is a little bit of an older um, schematic, but I like how it's um, showing around the world the different emerging diseases that are prevalent. Um, you can see there's a whole wide range of, of different diseases from drug-resistant bacterial infections, uh, drug-resistant malaria, uh, SARS in Asia. Um, the things that are missing, though, are the Ebola outbreak in West Africa from, you know, the 2012-2014, and then also the Zika outbreaks in South America, Brazil, and Central America, um, and chikungunya. But this does show that there are a broad range of emerging infectious diseases, many of which are being studied a lot at the research level, but due to travel and other, um, you know, new technologies, we're seeing the spread of these diseases in much different ways than we previously have seen them. And we're also seeing populations that never had to experience a certain disease experience the effects of that disease and also try to learn on a clinical basis how to deal with patients who may be infected with something that um, traditionally was not seen. And that is a good case of the Ebola um, patients in North America a few years ago when the clinicians and emergency responders were undergoing training to deal with those patients when previously we had never seen Ebola in the United States. So I want to switch gears and just talk about vector-borne diseases. Uh, vector-borne diseases have become a pretty hot topic uh, in the research world and the clinical world over the past few years. And there are certain um, diseases that people never talked about, but we're seeing a lot here in the United States now. Uh, the first one was chikungunya. Um, most people, when I say chikungunya, look at me funny because they've never heard of it. It's more of a disease, mosquito-borne, that we see um, in India. So this schematic of the world is um, showing you in different colors various vector-borne diseases, the locations we see them, if it's being found in an endemic area or if they're seeing sporadic outbreaks of those um, diseases. So in the United States, historically, we have seen um, some 
um, chikungunya, but we also see a lot of St. Louis encephalitis virus. We see yellow fever sometimes. Um, and we see a lot of West Nile, especially here in the Northeast. So we are also starting to see in certain areas the influence of Zika virus, which previously was in Africa in the 50s, and then we saw in South America and Central America, but due to spread of mosquitoes, we're starting to see that enter the very southern parts of um, the United States. And so this is just showing you the prevalence. I'm only going to briefly talk about a few of these arboviruses today, just because we could spend days talking about all of these different vector-borne diseases. So since Zika is um, very much in the news and there's a lot of concern around Zika, I wanted to mention it specifically. Zika virus is a flabby virus. Um, it's a single-strand positive RNA virus. So what that means is that if it enters the cell even as RNA, it can make infectious virus particles. Um, Zika virus is very close to dengue virus, so a lot of people who are studying Zika and its effects are also looking at dengue virus, the um, biology of them, because many times somebody with Zika infection has been previously infected with dengue virus because the geographical range of infection are pretty similar and overlapping. Um, Zika virus is transmitted um, by mosquitoes. It's also transmitted through semen. Um, accidental, you know, needle stick injuries, sharps injuries, exposure to blood and body and infectious body fluids through non-intact skin and mucous membrane exposure. And so really in a healthcare setting, you have to have direct contact with the blood or body fluids of somebody with Zika infection. Um, or if you've been previously infected with Zika and you are having sexual intercourse, you can transmit it to your partner. And there are documented cases and publications um, showing that. And so when we talk about employee safety, um, if somebody is infected, then you would need to take those in, the items into consideration. Zika virus is um, the biggest risk really is to pregnant women and developing fetus. Um, most of the time, the Zika infection is very self-limiting and we'll talk about symptoms in a moment, um, but the risk really is the microencephaly. The spread through the population, you know, one is um, the sylvatic cycle, the other is the urban cycle. The sylvatic cycle is really, you know, if you get bit by a mosquito, the blood meal will transmit the virus. Um, the other case is that if you are infected and a mosquito were to bite, then you can transmit the virus to the mosquito and then perpetuate the cycle. The other issue is in the urban setting, um, a lot of um, the control is going into controlling mosquito populations, standing water, um, spraying to decrease the amount of mosquitoes in that area because then you don't have any of the animals involved, you just have the human to mosquito transmission issue. And so I wanted to talk about the close cousins to Zika virus, mainly because I find that um, these other diseases have been very prevalent and there's not a lot of talk surrounding them, but the, it is important because if you travel to an area that were to have Zika virus prevalent, you also have dengue and chikungunya. And if you do some research with the health departments and you look online, chikungunya, dengue, and Zika, just by looking at the slide, have very similar symptoms. So it's very difficult to know which infection you have. You actually have to go have blood drawn and they run a series of tests because these viruses are so similar that you could have a positive um, sample and it might be dengue, it might be Zika, so then they have to do some more um, diagnostic tests in order to determine what the infection actually is. Um, so a lot of these symptoms are going to be malaise, um, sometimes arthralgia and like your joints, um, flu-like symptoms, and the one thing is that dengue virus, if you do get infected a second time, can become a hemorrhagic fever form. So it can be more serious if you've been infected a second time. Um, there are multiple serotypes of dengue, and so a reinfection is possible, especially in some of these areas. A lot of research groups are studying the differences between the infections and how, if you're infected with one of these viruses, if it can cause any ex more extreme infection if infected with another one. So how do we prevent uh, getting an arbovirus? I mean, right now, just going out into the woods, you can be bit by a tick or a mosquito, and you know the, the concern within the United States is not necessarily with those three viruses um, in certain areas, but more of West Nile, et cetera. 
um, though neither of those viruses are spread person to person with the exception of the vertical transmission with Zika virus. Um, so if you're in a healthcare setting and somebody were to come visit your area, unless you're exposed to their blood or body fluids, there is no way for you to become infected. So that's good. It makes the clinical um, work easier. So really, if you're working with someone or you're doing any type of blood draws or anything in that case, looking for infection, you need to use standard precautions for blood-borne pathogens. Most of these are very similar to any of the blood-borne pathogens that clinicians are used to dealing with every day. Um, so really good sharp safety is very important, using sharp containers, no recapping, and using safer needle devices. Um, and then if you are pregnant, using extreme caution um, with travel and following the travel guidelines for specific areas. Usually this involves um, mosquito netting and, um, you know, prevention of getting bit by mosquitoes um, to transmit these organisms. In a healthcare setting, again, using care with sharps um, and exposure to blood-borne pathogens would really be the primary precaution and would be what you should be doing as a pregnant worker at all times. So I'm going to switch gears now and talk about the hemorrhagic fever viruses. Um, initially, we thought to talk just on Ebola since we had the Ebola scare, but then here in New Jersey, we also had a loss of fever patient, and so I felt that talking about hemorrhagic fever viruses in general would be a bit more beneficial, um, just because with travel and with the prevalence of, of these viruses throughout the world, it is always possible, um, and some of them are endemic within the United States. So hemorrhagic fevers um, are caused by multiple virus families. I have a list here on the slide. Um, they're spread by multiple different mechanisms, mosquitoes, ticks, rodent um, excretions, bats, um, that kind of thing. All of them are RNA viruses, and they're all going to be linked to where their host animal lives. So these viruses are found within animals. A lot of them, their host is a bat or um, some kind of rodent, like hantavirus with um, with rat, the mice, um, and each of them is going to be a different level of severity in terms of infection. So with the Ebola patients, that level of infection is much more severe. The disease can be much more um, uh, robust. But then you have some infections, and loss of fever is a good example, where many times the person doesn't even realize they're infected with that virus, and they have a mild flu-like illness, and they recover with no issues. And so it really depends on the virus and on its um, pathogenicity and um, on the person's immune system. So this is just giving you a, a brief overview of where these viruses are found. Um, now we have a confirmed outbreak in the Republic of Congo, which is where Ebola is traditionally found. And unfortunately, they're having an outbreak going on right now. It was just recently confirmed in that area. Which is, con which is concerning for the healthcare providers and also surrounding countries to ensure that it can stay more localized instead of spreading. Um, recently, a couple of years ago, we saw Ebola in Western Africa, which was previously not seen. It was found in more urban areas and spread and really led to significant public health issues within Africa. Um, and as many of you know, we had a couple of cases in the United States due to travel and then um, persons being infected from the patients that traveled from Africa due to improper practices um, when caring for those patients. So a lot of the clinical training has improved and a lot of dialogue has improved, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, to in ensure worker protection um, and patient safety when infected with those kinds of viruses. So in terms of the, the viruses in these families, you have the fetal virus family, which is, you know, Ebola, Marburg, arena viruses, which include loss of fever, Bunya virus, which includes Crimean Congo and Rifali fever, Flavi viruses, which are the tick-borne viruses, so this includes dengue, and paramyxoviruses, which are Hendra and Nipah. And so all of these viruses are very common in their geographical origin, none of which, though, are found in the United States. We do have things like hantavirus that are found in the southwest area, though. So symptoms of hemorrhagic fever infection, um, the initial symptoms are flu-like symptoms. And so the problem, I think, with infectious disease in general, a lot of times, especially as a biosafety officer, when you teach someone on what the symptoms are, the symptoms are usually nondescript and flu-like. And so it can really be anything, especially a challenge for clinicians when they're trying to diagnose someone. And so 
with these, it's important to ask, and people were asking about travel and travel to various um, countries. And so that's something that's still sometimes being asked in various clinical sites to ascertain better what that person might have been exposed to and what they might be sick with. So in terms of the hemorrhagic fever, like I said, some of them are going to have different severities. So the symptoms might be slightly different depending on what the um, virus is. Um, some of them may cause a very limited infection and the person stays at home for a couple of days with a mild fever and mild um, flu-like symptoms and then they go about their business. Other things like Ebola are gonna be much more severe. You have general pain in the muscles, nausea, vomiting, sometimes bleeding and bruising, sometimes eye redness, conjunctivitis, and then um, usually some kind of internal bleeding. Um, what the reports were with the most recent Ebola infection was that it started to manifest more like a cholera infection and not so much like a, a general um, hemorrhagic fever. So there was more diarrhea and vomiting and less bleeding. So the transmission of hemorrhagic fever viruses um, many times is in the site of the host. And so sometimes um, it's in the country areas where a person may be coming into contact with an infected animal. Um, sometimes it could be a non-human primate or um, a bat or um, a rodent or an infected animal that was exposed to the natural host. So a lot of times they're still, in terms of these viruses, the exact transmission cycle is not completely understood. It really depends on which one we're talking about. Then we have, especially in Africa, you have hunters hunting these animals that might be sick, and then they bring that, that animal home um, to the village, and then the family um, may help them to, to skin the animal. They come into contact with blood, different fluids from the animal, and then um, become ill. Those people then go to a hospital setting, and hospitals are very different than they are here in the United States, and so sometimes these things can spread very quickly between people. So how do we deal with this in our settings? Um, I'm sure that now that we have another Ebola outbreak, um, there could be more guidance from CDC in terms of travel inquiries for patients. So during the last outbreak, uh, patients were asked, as soon as they walked into any healthcare site, uh, where have you gone in the past 21 days? And the 21-day rule came from the, the um, incubation period for Ebola virus. So um, that sometimes helps to determine if somebody should be put and um, have further uh, evaluation before treatment. Extreme caution with sharps is very important. Um, again, these are mostly transmitted through like droplets and uh, bloodborne roots. And so most of these viruses are not transmitted through the respiratory route. So a respirator is not necessarily required, but is used in terms of you know, very sick patients and um, helping to prevent you know, mucous membrane exposure. So I'll talk about more of that in a second. The PPE really is crucial depending on the person who's sick. So during the last outbreak, we worked a lot with various um, clinics at Rutgers University and a lot of different um, personnel who see patients of varying sorts. And so each training has to be a little bit different. And so if you are seeing, if you're a social worker and you're seeing somebody come into your area and they have uh, flu-like symptoms, if it's a potential travel issue, then you put the person in an ambulance and they get sent to an appropriate site. That was the training that we did. Now that may not necessarily be what is needed, but that person is gonna have a different risk than the person who's caring for a very sick patient with confirmed infection and doing um, you know, sort of the intensive care, or respiratory care on that patient. And so the persons working in infectious disease and the, um, the people in sort of the intensive care units receive different training. They receive training on the PPE that you see in this picture on how to wear a Tyvek suit, how to wear a powered air purifying respirator. And again, they're wearing the respirator not because it's transmitted through the respiratory route, but to help protect their mucous membranes. You can see the plastic shield helps prevent anything from getting in your eyes, getting in your mouth, getting into something that's unbroken skin, whereas an N95 becomes very hot um, and you know, if somebody is wiggling their nose and touching their face because it's uncomfortable, then it increases the chance that they could be um, doing a self-inoculation. So the other thing that's really important here is hand washing. Uh, hand washing is crucial and not just always with um, 
the antimicrobial materials that are in healthcare settings, but using soap and water. Um, the hand sanitizers do not remove infectious materials. And so if you're working with a patient who's very sick and you think it's a hemorrhagic fever virus, then you need to really remove the materials. And the best way to do that is soap and water. Disinfectants are crucial. And so we're going to talk more about disinfectants at the end, but knowing which disinfectant is effective is very important. The EPA has a list of disinfectants that are used for potential hemorrhagic fever virus uh, cleanup. And so they have an approved list. And so for healthcare settings that would need to have this information, um, it's a nice list that is available online um, and can um, provide people with much better information in choosing a disinfectant than just grabbing a bottle of bleach, which bleach works too, but having an EPA registered disinfectant is always helpful. And then training. Training is really important. A lot of patients who have hemorrhagic fever viruses infection, they're very sick patients. Um, they're going to be seen by a select few people who need to have training on both the patient care side, but also the conjunction of patient care with um, preventing exposure to themselves. Because there's a lot of um, procedures that are going to be performed on these patients, and clinicians are not used to wearing Tyvek suits and two pairs of gloves and having a big piece of plastic between their face and the patient necessarily. And so some of the patient care um, techniques need to be practiced and the donning and doffing of this personal protective equipment needs to be practiced by the healthcare providers. And um, there has to be a different um, attention pay paid to the clinicians putting themselves also at, um, at first instead of their patient. I know that was a, an issue that came up a lot when we were training healthcare providers and telling them, you know, if you have a breach in your PPE, you need to stop what you're doing and leave. And for them, that was very different from anything that they had in their training. And it made them think about what they were doing a little differently. And so training is really important and hands-on training is crucial. Sitting and learning about this kind of training in a room on a computer is not really very effective especially when, it, when you're dealing with the personal protective equipment items. And so I'm going to switch gears now really away to from things that we may not see very often in clinical settings to things that clinicians see every day. Um, and this is really the drug-resistant microbes. And so before I get into it, um, just for those of you who may not really understand the, how resistance is formed in uh, microbial communities. I have a short video to show you. This video is from Harvard. It's a really nice dis description of how antimicrobial resistance can form, how it's natural, and then really how those organisms can um, continue evolving and, and take over. So what we ended up building was basically a Petri dish except that it's two feet by four feet. And the way we set it up is that there are nine bands, and at the base of each of these bands, we put a normal Petri dish thick agar with different amounts of antibiotic. On the outside, there's no antibiotic. Just in from that, there's barely more than the E. coli can survive. Inside of that, there's 10 times as much, 100 times, and then finally, the middle band has 1,000 times as much antibiotic. And then across the top of it, pour some thin agar that bacteria can move around in. The background is black because there's ink in it, and the bacteria appear as white. First, you see they spread in the area where there's no antibiotic, up until the point they can no longer survive. Then a mutant appears on the right. It's resistant to the antibiotic, it spreads, until it starts to compete with other mutants around it. When these mutants hit the next boundary, they too have to pause and develop new mutations to make it into 10 times as much antibiotic. And then you see the different mutants repeat this at 100. And after about 11 days, they finally make it into 1,000 times as much antibiotic as the wild type can survive. And so we can see by this process of accumulating successive mutations that bacteria, which are normally sensitive to an antibiotic, can evolve resistance to extremely high concentrations in a short period of time. So 
So hopefully that helped provide a little overview of where I'm going. And so drug-resistant microorganisms are a huge concern, and they're emerging and re-emerging because previously we've been able to cure infections with these organisms with antibiotics. And then for various reasons, um, most of which include improper use of antibiotics, overuse of antibiotics, um, these organisms have become resistant. So I'm going to talk about three today. One is vancomycin-resistant Staph aureus, the other uh, carbapenemum-resistant Enterobacteriaceae, and then the third is drug-resistant tuberculosis. I think, you know, we work with a lot with various clinical sites, and we talk a lot about tuberculosis, and it's unfortunately one of the areas that's highly overlooked, but especially in our area of New Jersey, we have a lot of patients with TB, and so I think it's really important to always continue talking about this disease. So the first is um, vancomycin-resistant Staph aureus. And the most important thing to understand with Staph aureus is that people can be colonized with no symptoms. And when they're colonized, they can spread this illness. And so if surfaces are contaminated and not properly cleaned, then somebody else who touches that surface a little while later can become um, infected. If that person has a weakened immune system, they can become um, sick with um, vancomycin-resistant Staph aureus infection. We also have Staph aureus that's resistant to methicillin, which is more commonly known as MRSA, and which is discussed all the time. In many hospital settings, before a patient is, um, or as a patient is being um, assessed and put into um, the inpatient setting, they have a nose swab to see if they're colonized. So that way they can ensure that they don't put a person with um, Staph aureus in their nose in the same room as somebody without. Um, fortunately, these um, organisms are just still susceptible to other antibiotics. And so with Staph aureus, we see drug resistance, but a lot of times the strains are still susceptible to um, one or another antibiotic. And so that's really important because we can still provide treatment to persons with infection. Um, Staph aureus tends to uh, present on these people with like more of a skin infection, um, and they may see boils and different things on their skin. Um, there have been cases in school settings and other settings where people are very closely um, in close living quarters and that kind of thing. Um, the, the transmission is going to be direct contact, so you really have to have contact with the person or with their um, the area on their body that is having the infection. It's not something you can get by sitting close to them, um, you know, breathing in their air, et cetera. So people who are working with patients need to wear contact precautions. Uh, this is really people who are performing diagnostics, again, not necessarily somebody in um, a social care setting or um, like a behavioral health care setting, unless they're having direct contact, drawing blood, or, um, you know, having to potentially come into contact with like a boil or a lesion on someone's skin. Um, a lot of times, depending on what is being done, uh, face shield and eye protection is really important to prevent any exposure to mucous membranes. Staph aureus is one of those organisms that can manage to cause infection in almost every part of your body imaginable. Um, and so you have to protect to make sure that you don't introduce it into an area it shouldn't be introduced. Hand hygiene is really important to prevent the spread of this organism, as is proper cleaning of um, contaminated surfaces. So again, a lot of times folks might use the hand sanitizer, and it's just important to understand what hand sanitizer is being used and whether or not it's effective against Staph aureus. Most of them will be effective but it's always better to use soap and water. The next one is really a scary bug. So this is carb carbapenemum-resistant Enterobacteriaceae. So this includes uh, Klebsiella and E. coli, both of which are mostly a concern um, in shedding of stool. Um, that's really going to be a major issue, and so it leads to maybe a contamination of a bathroom. And so people can share you know, bathrooms or improper hand hygiene, and so it's spread that way. Um, most of the time, somebody with this infection, if it gets into their bloodstream, 50% of them will die. Um, most of the time, we see people um, with this infection in hospitals and nursing homes, and they're older folks with immunocompromised um, situations of one nature or another. The problem here is that there are strains of Enterobacteriaceae that are resistant to all known antibiotics. And so there were recent publications this year where we've had our, our, a couple of deaths in the United States to those strains, and the, there are a lot of researchers trying to develop new drugs that will be able to treat these infections. 
because we're getting to the point with these infections that they were previously treatable and now we're having folks die from things because we have so much resistance that they can't be treated. Um, so it's really important to keep somebody who has a potential infection you know, segregated from other folks um, so they don't spread this uh, organism and also to always wear gloves, gowns, um, and good hand hygiene which includes soap and water uh, to ensure the prevention of spread of these organisms to other persons who would be susceptible, especially in these populations because you're always going to have immunocompromised uh, people, especially in the elderly population or um, people who might have other kinds of illnesses that are recovering from surgery, might be on various medications that make them more susceptible to these infections. And then the last is tuberculosis. So um, tuberculosis is still a prevalent uh, infection around the world, including the United States, even though we don't hear so much about it all the time. Um, every year we have about 500,000 new cases, and this schematic here shows um, the darker green colors are the areas where we have um, the highest amount of new cases. So you can see that would be mostly in Asia, Russia, um, and some of the Middle Eastern countries. But we also have um, some drug-resistant cases pretty much spread all around the country. So some of these strains are um, drug-resistant, some of them are multi-drug resistant, some are um, extremely drug-resistant, and some are totally drug-resistant. And so we have seen the spread of some of the totally drug-resistant strains, and so basically the people there have no real recourse, although there are folks looking to find additional um, antimicrobials that these people can be treated. The problem with tuberculosis and drug resistance is that this organism grows very slowly. And so in order to treat somebody with tuberculosis, they need to be on antibiotics for six months, sometimes longer, depending on the potential strain of, that they've been exposed to. There are a lot of really great diagnostic tools that will help understand the strain that the person may have been exposed to. Um, and maybe sick with, but um, a lot of times if they need to be on a more rigorous antimicrobial treatment, it's a very long duration. Some of the antimicrobials are not well tolerated and the people stop taking them, which then helps to breed the drug resistance. So this one's really important um, in terms of its transmission because tuberculosis is spread through the respiratory route meaning if you have somebody who is contagious, meaning they have active tuberculosis disease and they are coughing um, and producing sputum, that the persons in a proximity to them could become exposed. The good thing with tuberculosis is that not everybody who's exposed will become sick. Um, most of the times you get a latent infection and your immune system deals with it, but if you have an immunocompromised um, situation, you may have a more likely chance of um, becoming sick yourself. The other problem is that if you have latent infection, um, many clinicians will treat you as if you have active infection to help prevent any um, activity with that tuberculosis bacterium. So this being said, every clinic I know in New Jersey is supposed to have what's called a TB infection control plan. And this infection control plan also has a risk assessment that is included with it. And what the clinics are supposed to do is assess their risk of seeing potential tuberculosis patients. And then what do they do? And so if somebody comes in um, with potential tuberculosis disease, where do you put them? Who sees them? What PPE do you wear, et cetera? Most of the time, clinics are going to put the person um, into a room and call an ambulance and get them over to a local hospital that has isolation rooms. Um, because tuberculosis is a respiratory um, transmissible disease, uh, these patients tend to go into negative pressure rooms. Sometimes people will put a face mask on them, like a surgical mask, to help prevent any droplet um, um, transmission from sneezing or coughing. Um, but most of the time, you know, they just go to a specific tuberculosis clinic or a negative pressure room for evaluation. Diagnosis is typically by chest x-ray and um, uh, analysis of sputum. So the other issue, though, with tuberculosis patients is that people with active tuberculosis are most often co-infected with multiple other infectious diseases, most commonly HIV and aspergillus. And so a healthcare person needs to take this into account that somebody with active TB could also very likely have active HIV infection. They could have aspergillus infection. And so the protections there, again, are just standard blood-borne pathogen, um, you know, sharps, precautions, 
uh, disinfection cleaning, but also just to be sure that if there is an exposure that um, to that patient, then you have the proper follow-up in terms of potential HIV infection. Tuberculosis is also hard to kill. And so disinfectants that one may use to um, disinfect surfaces against Staph aureus, for instance, may not be able to be used against tuberculosis. And so the EPA has a really nice list of tuberculocidal disinfectants. And so, um, you know, they have a great list of all these different disinfectants that treat various different um, infectious diseases that you can use. And the most important thing is the contact time, because since tuberculosis is um, a bit more difficult to inactivate, you need to have the disinfectant soak the surface for a longer period of time. Um, but, but again, tuberculosis-specific clinics are well-versed and well-trained in dealing with these issues, and it comes back down to that TB infection control plan and the risk assessment that um, clinicians can always work with their biosafety, infection control professionals, and other um, environmental health and safety professionals to develop to ensure the protection of their staff. And so to summarize today's presentation, um, you know, the most important thing really is SHARPS prevention. A lot of the things, a lot of infectious diseases that clinicians are going to see are going to be transmitted through percutaneous injury, um, mucous membrane exposure, and other SHARPS-related injuries. As a biosafety officer, I follow up with a lot of SHARPS accidents, many of which would be avoided with people using the proper techniques of a SHARPS container, um, for sharps and not recapping needles. Um, that helps to avoid a lot of employee injuries. Making sure that um, personnel have special training in personal protective equipment and understanding when different precautions need to be used. You know, droplet precautions are different than respiratory precautions. Um, and that brings us into the PPE training, but also in respiratory protection and respirator training. And so personnel who need to wear respirators need to be enrolled in um, a medical um, monitoring plan, and they have to be assessed annually and fit tested annually, or if they have any major changes in weight, to ensure that that respirator is still going to fit them and provide the right protections when they need to wear that respirator. But staff need to understand when a respirator is needed and not to default to it all the time. And then hand hygiene. Um, many times you... And you don't wash your hands the way you should wash your hands, right? And so we're all guilty of this. And so hand hygiene is really crucial to prevent the spread of any infectious agent. Um, if you sneeze and it's on your hand, wash your hands. And so um, using the hand sanitizer is great, but there are organisms that do not have any effect, that hand sanitizer has no effect on them. Um, and so making sure you understand the effectiveness of the hand sanitizer versus just soap and water is always beneficial. And the last thing is reporting. So a lot of emerging infectious diseases are required to be reported both to, you know, maybe your infection control person, to the local and state health departments, um, maybe to, if you're in a big institution, to your biosafety officers, um, or if there's an accident, that needs to be reported also, um, or a potential exposure to infectious material. And so making sure you understand at your institution how accident reporting or even just a case of an infectious um, an emerging disease in a patient would be reported is really important to understand how the follow-up will be happening. Many times with a lot of these infectious agents, especially the hemorrhagic diseases, the local and state health department will come visit the site and provide um, support to the local areas um, to ensure um, patient safety and also employee safety and proper you know, adherence to compliance and regulations. So with that, um, I put a couple of resources here. Um, I didn't list the EPA registered disinfectants, but it's very easy to find that via Google. Um, and there's a lot of different lists um, for you there. And also the CDC website in general is a very great resource to understanding more for the clinicians and diagnostics um, of all emerging diseases. They update their websites very frequently um, and have new alerts pretty much every day. So with that, I can go through the questions because we have a few questions in the chat box. Um, let me try to do this. Oh, uh, so um, one of the questions is to discuss C. diff following a course of antibiotics. So, you know, I'm not an infectious um, disease MD. 
So I can't necessarily discuss all of this, although I know that C. diff is very prevalent in um, the healthcare setting. Uh, C. diff is not susceptible to hand sanitizers, and people who are on, um, not necessarily a round of antibiotics, but they might be on um, some kind of medication. This is very common in chemotherapy patients, where if they're exposed to somebody with C. diff, then they're going to be much more likely to become infected with C. diff. C. diff is a very serious disease. Um, not very many antibiotics will, will kill C. diff. Um, and if it's not caught early, it can have really um, traumatic effects on somebody's um, intestines. So um, if somebody is susceptible or if somebody knows that they have um, a C. diff colonizi colonizing infection, then they need to make sure they speak with, to the, with their doctors. But I'm not sure I can really go into too much more there. Uh, dengue, mosquito or tick? Dengue is mosquito. Um, so the next question is, are drug-resistant microbes more dangerous in a healthcare setting? Um, they're not going to necessarily be more transmissible or um, spread differently. So the, the fact that they're drug-resistant isn't necessarily going to change how it's transmissible or how um, pathogenic it is. The problem is that it's going to um, be much more difficult to cure if somebody is infected. And so if you have a workplace exposure or accident, the result to you is much worse than if it was a drug susceptible strain. And so also because these organisms, just because of the nature of them, are spread very easily, the fact is that these organisms can be spread and then if they're spread to other patients, it's going to make it much more difficult to treat those other patients. And the problem is that they're being spread um, most commonly in these settings for various reasons. Um, and making um, it just much more difficult to control them. So I hope I answered that question. Um, I'm not missing any what prevention. Is there a way to make the um, questions bigger? What prevention uh, measures do you suggest for outdoor workers exposed to mosquitoes potentially carrying an infectious disease? Um, so that's really a great question. So. A lot of times, workers should be using appropriate, oh, thank you. Um, they can be using, you know, like mosquito netting kind of around their face. They should be wearing long pants, light colored clothing. Um, they should also be using some kind of um, chemical insecticide that, you know, like DEET. Uh, DEET pretty much kills everything. Um, and also, the CDC has a huge list for each of these various um, organisms, like the different measures that somebody working outside can take. And so for the most part, you know, even if you're just hiking in the woods, you want to wear light colored clothing, you know, socks and shoes, not, not you know, having open skin where these, um, where various ticks or mosquitoes can um, cause a bite. Uh, and carrying DEET is important also. Is TB considered endemic or epidemic in the U.S.? Um, I think it depends on which area of the United States that you're talking about. Um, there are some areas where TB is really both, I think. So tuberculosis disease is prevalent throughout the United States. Um, and there are certain areas that um, it is epidemic. So in certain um, urban locations or in certain populations, then you see TB more prevalent. But really, it is endemic throughout the United States. Um, in regards to Zika virus, how safe are those who work in the dental profession? Um, so that's a really great question. Dentists need to make sure they're wearing eye protection and that they are being very careful with the sharps. Um, I know in the dental profession, there's a lot of reusable sharps um, equipment and not necessarily needles, but the burrs and other things that you're using. Um, when they're getting cleaned. So depending on um, the person and the state of their illness, I would say Zika virus is going to be a very similar risk to any of the blood-borne pathogens that you're dealing with in a dental setting. And so somebody with HIV infection, the, the transmission would be very similar to you as a dentist um, as Zika virus. It's going to be very difficult to, for you to know if somebody has Zika because they might just come in with 
flu-like symptoms. Um, but again, even in that case, maybe they shouldn't be there that day, right? And so as a clinician, you have the right to, if somebody has a really active um, respiratory infection or seems like they have the flu, you know, to potentially ask them to reschedule. But it is really important. We see a lot of accidents with burrs and other um, sharps devices in a dental setting. Um, sometimes it might be great to autoclave those devices before you clean them, so that way you kill whatever might be on the device before you actually have to scrub it clean, because a lot of times we see the injuries when people are cleaning devices. So if you have an autoclave, uh, that would be a great thing to use. Um, can I comment on the current situation with Candida Oris in New Jersey? You know, I haven't, I've heard about this situation. Um, I don't know too much about it other than that Candida auris is something that we find everywhere in the environment, just like Candida albicans. Um, I know it's affecting an immunosuppressed population. I can get more information and, um, and send it out. Um, is there ongoing research for developing new drugs for these antibiotic resistant strains? The answer is yes. There's research all the time. There's a ton of money going into developing new uh, treatments for antibiotic resistant strains. All the things I talked about are things that um, are being uh, studied at Rutgers and at other locations. Um, and a lot of chemists are actually working on developing new drugs to treat these strains. Are physicians using specific guidelines for determining when an antibiotic is really necessary? Um, I remember seeing physicians prescribing antibiotics from something they were suspecting was viral. You know, I can only say anecdotally that that what I know is yes. Um, I myself have gone um, to the doctor and they think it's a virus and so they tell you straight out that they're not going to give you antibiotics. Um, I also um, have seen the opposite, where somebody gives antibiotics just because they think it might help the infection. I do think more physicians are becoming much more cognizant to this issue and giving out antibiotics as needed and when, um, when something calls for an antibiotic. But again, you know, I'm not an MD, so I can't really speak to all the details there. I think I answered all of them. The endemic for TB? Yeah, I answered that. So I think I've answered all of the questions. Um, oh, there's one more. So uh, Dr. Weiss just mentioned um, that at last week's Infectious Disease Society of New Jersey annual meeting, there was a full up-to-date lecture on Canada Oris in New Jersey. And so I can pull that information um, and, and, and send it to the registrants. Um, Okay. All right. So we're pretty much out of time. So thank you so much for watching and joining in the webinar. Uh, this will be posted um, on the website for future um, resource. Thank you.